Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with your third lecture on cell metabolism. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the last two steps, steps three and four, um, in making ATP through aerobic cellular respiration. These two steps are the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. The Krebs cycle takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria, and the electron transport chain where we'll have a lot of ATP synthesis, is located and takes place in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So just to review a little bit, recall that when we started with glucose, through glycolysis we made pyruvate. And then pyruvate was changed into acetyl-CoA, which was um, which had the ability to get into the matrix of the mitochondria. So now we begin the Krebs cycle in the matrix. The Krebs cycle consists of nine different chemical reactions. And um, those chemical reactions are going to produce some gas in the form of carbon dioxide, a little bit of ATP, Maybe the most important product is NADH, okay? So we'll look at those in a little bit more detail. So first, the first reaction of the nine takes the acetyl-CoA that has entered the matrix and combines it with a four carbon compound called oxaloacetate. Now, if you recall, acetyl-CoA had two carbons. So the product of this reaction, citric acid, has six carbons. This is, um, this is catalyzed by an enzyme located in the matrix called citrate synthetase, or citrate synthase sometimes. Now, through a series of the other eight chemical reactions, this oxaloacetate is going to be regenerated. That's why sometimes the Krebs cycle is shown as a cycle. Now this oxaloacetate, if it's located at this step, I'm just going to put an O for oxalo, and the acetyl-CoA comes in here. We're going to get a product, and that product is going to change to eventually regenerate the oxaloacetate. So that's why it's a cycle. Now, if more acetyl-CoA ends up coming into the cell, the oxaloacetate that's been regenerated is ready for it. So sometimes people refer to the Krebs cycle as the citric acid cycle assuming that there's plenty of acetyl-CoA around from glucose breakdown to make this citric acid because oxaloacetate always gets regenerated. And um, it's hard to imagine with my drawing. So we are going to look at the reactions, but you won't have to know all the detail. So don't get alarmed too much yet. Okay, so what we do know about the Krebs cycle is that acetyl-CoA has two carbons and it comes into the matrix and joins with a four carbon oxaloacetate. Together, they form citrate or citric acid, it's the same thing, that has six carbons. And we also know that the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is citrate synthase or synthetase. So you should know that. That's the only step that you really have to know. The rest of what you should know is that through the reactions two through nine, so the rest of them, I just sort of marking here, oxaloacetate is regenerated. So we go from six carbons back to four carbons in order that another acetyl-CoA can be accepted. Well, what happened to the other carbons? 
when we go from six to four, there's two lost. Well, that's where carbon dioxide comes from. It comes from those carbons, okay? In the process of rearranging these compounds as well as breaking bonds, there are electrons free to um, attach to NAD+. So NADH is produced and lots of it is produced at various steps. FADH is a molecule very or compound very similar to NADH. They all will carry electrons to the electron transport chain. And then finally, you should also know that one of the steps, one of the nine, produces ATP. So we do get a little bit of ATP from the Krebs cycle, but not a lot. So let's think about the Krebs cycle in terms of starting with a glucose that has six carbons, okay? First of all, you know that we're going to break that down into two three carbon compounds before we ever get to the Krebs cycle. Therefore, the Krebs cycle actually turns twice for one glucose. So we get carbon dioxide, we get NADH, and we get some ATP. The starting material for the Krebs cycle or starting organic compound is acetyl-CoA. The end is carbon dioxide, okay? And of course, we do make some ATP, which used to be ADP. And finally, but certainly not least, we're gonna make some NADH. So now we'll move on to the electron transport chain. What is the electron transport chain? Well, it's a series, or that means many, transmembrane proteins that lie next to each other. These transmembrane proteins are in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and there's a bunch that are, that are electron carriers. Like NADH could carry electrons, so can these proteins. So the electrons are going to move from one protein to the next. That's kinetic energy that will be turned in to chemical energy. So some of the electron carriers are just called coenzymes. You don't have to really know that. Some of them are proton pumps. This you do have to know. It's very important. So as the electrons are moving to the proton pumps, that gives the um, pumps or the transmembrane proteins, um, the energy required to pump protons. So hydrogen ions are going to be pumped. The very last transmembrane protein in a series isn't an electron carrier. Instead, it is an enzyme. And, you know, truthfully, it is also a channel for hydrogen ions to move through. So the name of the enzyme is ATP synthase. That is our last transmembrane protein. As a, and as you can imagine, ATP synthase is going to make ATP. So here's a picture of the components of the electron transport chain. We are in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Here's the matrix. And the NADH has been produced in various locations, the cytoplasm as well as the matrix. But it travels to the matrix, even if it wasn't already there, and drops off electrons. So electrons get dropped off. And then the electron is going to go over to this coenzyme, and then into this pump, and then to this coenzyme, and then to this pump. So the electron continues to move, and here he is at the very end, okay? Now, in addition, NADH can drop off its hydrogen, and um, there are already some hydrogen ions present here, but this is a region of low 
hydrogen ion concentration. So it's not going to be possible for just diffusion to carry these hydrogen ions. Instead, there has to be this energy from the electron moving. And these pumps pump the hydrogens into the intermembrane space. And so now we have high hydrogen across from low hydrogen. So we have a gradient. Now, this transmembrane protein called ATP synthase allows hydrogen ions to diffuse. No energy is required for this movement of hydrogen. And so hydrogen goes from a region of high to a region of low through the channel. Now the name is called ATP synthase. So I'm hoping you realize that's linked to the production of ATP. This movement or diffusion of hydrogen fuels the production of ATP by this transmembrane protein. So here's a picture of the location of the um, electron transport chain in relation, you know, sort of with the rest of the cell and the intermembrane space. So I'm just going to talk about it a little bit here, not a lot, because it's a it's repeat. But you know, we had some NADH that was made. It would be better if I typed, but I can't. We have some NADH that was made in the uh, cytoplasm. This NADH will just diffuse to the um, matrix. So all the NADH ends up in the matrix. The matrix is where the Krebs cycle was. Pyruvate oxidation happens in the intermembrane space. That NADH comes in and then glycolysis NADH comes in. Bringing electrons. Now these electrons move from transmembrane protein to transmembrane protein. So first this one, then to the Q, then to this one, and then to the C, and then to this one. That's where all the electrons go. As they jump from one to the next, transmembrane protein in the chain, that is, then <clears throat> that's kinetic energy that's harnessed by these proton pumps that pump hydrogens. So hydrogens are put into the intermembrane space. So we have high hydrogen here as a result and low hydrogen on the inside here. It's not gone, but it's lower. Now what can happen is the last trans transmembrane protein is ATP synthase, and it's also a channel. So it allows the hydrogen ions to move back into the matrix. And when that happens, the ATP synthase turns. It changes its conformation and that fuels the production of ATP. So the movement of hydrogen ions is linked to the production of ATP. And you can see that we don't just get one or two, we get a lot of ATP from one molecule of glucose in the electron transport chain. So the function of the electron transport chain is to take the electrons away from NADH and the hydrogen atoms. The electrons are going to move through the transmembrane proteins. Okay, Sometimes they're called carriers, sometimes they're called coenzymes. And that provides the energy for pumping hydrogen. Therefore, those hydrogens are pumped into the intermembrane space, but the important thing is that that creates a gradient. Okay, so high in the intermembrane space, low in the 
matrix. So here's a picture. High here, low here, because hydrogens have been pumped out of the matrix. And finally, ATP synthesis, synthase, just or synthetase, either one, just to make sure you understand, it's an ion channel, and it's also an enzyme. So it allows the diffusion of hydrogen, and it fuels the production of ATP when the hydrogens diffuse through. This type of hydrogen ion diffusion that's going through an enzyme, which is also a channel, is referred to as chemiosmosis. And the reason I'm bringing that up at all is because the hydrogen that's going to come back in to the matrix, it might just get pumped out again. But it can also combine with oxygen because we are in an aerobic environment, our cells are, there's O2 around, okay? That means that water is going to be formed. So after this is all kaput or over, so to speak, the electron that's been jumping around, pom, 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 like that, eventually has to find somewhere to land. And where it lands, is on oxygen. So oxygen is reduced. Electrons go to the oxygen. We call it the final electron acceptor. And in addition, some hydrogen ions have come through ATP synthase, as well as maybe they weren't all pumped out. And so those two things combine together to produce water. So just by making ATP, our cells make water at the same time. It's called metabolic water. Kangaroo rats can live on just that water for a long period of time. They live in the Southwest. They don't have to drink very much. So the summary of the electron transport chain is that it captures electrons to fuel the diffusion of hydrogen, well, first the pumping of hydrogen and then the diffusion of hydrogen, all in order to generate ATP by ATP synthase. Water is produced as well. And a nice side effect is that the NADH loses the hydrogen. So this NAD plus is regenerated and it can accept another electron. The net production of ATP from all four steps are listed in this slide. So we got two from glycolysis, at least net. The transition reaction, none. The Krebs cycle from one molecule of glucose, we get two. And look at how much we get from the electron transport chain, just for one molecule of glucose. Right? So in total, we get quite a bit. They usually say between 30, around 36, but if you add up the range, it, it, it varies. Okay, that is the end of the four steps. Um, there's one more metabolism lecture to go. But that's it for now. Thank you.